Hey, everybody. It's Michael Angelo Caruso. Welcome back to another Talk To Me podcast. My guest today is a new friend. This is Jeff Caponegro, everybody. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Michael. How are you? I'm great, man. You know, every time I talk to you, I find out we have even more in common, and that makes me like you more. <laughs> and I'm just, I've just really been looking forward to chatting with you because um, we have similar backgrounds, but even more interesting than that, you do something for a living that everybody needs to know about. And uh, before we get into that, I want to I want to frame this up properly and talk a little bit about your credentials, so everybody knows who who you are and why your message is so important. Um, Jeff Jeffrey Caponegro, everybody works at Tryon Solutions. He's executive vice president there of corporate communications and marketing, and he has a deep deep background in crisis management, specifically I think Jeff crisis prevention. Correct. Uh, yeah, that's right, Michael. I, um, it, it's called sort of crisis planning and crisis communications, but the overall umbrella would be crisis management. Um, Wouldn't it be great to, if everybody that ever had a crisis? Prevent- yeah, how to prepare for a crisis before it happens and then what to do once a crisis occurs. Um, that's, uh, that's something sort of I've learned over the years and wrote a book on it uh, a few years ago. Yeah, the book is called The Crisis Counselor. It's been published in multiple languages. How many? Uh, Five languages. Five languages. And it's really, uh, I haven't had a chance to read it yet, truth be told. But um, this is what's kind of set the stage for you in public relations, uh, your reputation. And you're about to be inducted into the Michigan Public Relations Hall of Fame. Do I have that correct? Uh, It's the Detroit chapter of the Public Relations Society of America. Amazing. And, you know, if you're not familiar. (laughs) If you're not from Michigan, everything happens in Detroit down here. All the, all the actions right. in the bottom part of the state. Right. I know this right. is quite an honor, and I know it's the, the event is coming up, and I want to thank you for inviting Renee and me to the dinner. Oh, absolutely. I can't wait to help you celebrate. Yeah. Let's talk, about, um, let's talk about a campaign that you were involved with that's really uh, became a signature for you. It's one of the largest public relation campaigns in history and, it, and to a great extent it's a prevention campaign you're going to well, take us back a few years for this yeah yeah it, it 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 does take us back a few years but it's uh you know in our business in public relations and marketing you know we're trying to change opinions attitudes right. um it's very rare when we have an opportunity to change behavior and in from 1984 to 1992 I had the pleasure of uh, being involved with the uh, uh, American auto industry for a coalition that came together um, called Traffic Safety Now. And it was a coalition whose focus was to encourage and uh, increase safety belt use around the country. Now you think about in 1984, the seatbelt use was about 9% nationally. So we, we had a public relations campaign that lasted from 84 to 92 with Traffic Safety Now that involved encouraging states to pass seatbelt laws. And then once those laws were passed to uh, encourage seatbelt use and Seatbelt use today is, is about, I think, 98% uh, in, in the United States. You, you can imagine that hundreds of thousands of lives have been saved over the years because of, of the law to encourage people to buckle up. Yeah, it's got to be gratifying. Uh, and, and law enforcement to enforce it and to know that it was a popular law that people want. You know, if my children are driving, my relatives are driving, my fellow coworkers are driving, we want them to be buckled up. And uh, that's what that law did. So we won the uh, Public Relations Society of America's top national award um, called the Silver Anvil for that. And also PR Week Magazine that comes out in New York named it one of the top 10 uh, most successful PR campaigns of all time. So it was quite a big deal. Wow. Why an anvil? Uh, Because an anvil, um, if you're pounding an anvil, you're shaping something. You're shaping an attitude. 
or in this case, we were shaping an attitude and behavior. Yeah. So that's what that's what public relations people do is we can yeah. help help shape through oftentimes through research, through uh, uh, messaging, persuasive information, and really understanding who we're communicating with in a sociable, socially responsible way. That's really what public relations is. And iteration. It's going to take many, many messages through a variety of modalities to change this mindset slash behavior. I think a lot of people watching right now are having trouble getting their heads around the fact that there was a time that people didn't have to buckle their seatbelts. Yeah. I yeah. Mean, it's, it's I mean, really mind boggling if you think about it. And remember back then that if you had an old car, the dashboards were like made out of cement, just about, right? So you would not have wanted to have gotten in an accident with no seatbelt on. And uh, way before airbags. Way before airbags. Right. So, so let's stay in that little frame for a minute, everybody. Uh, yeah. Those of you watching. I mean, there was a time when, when, when the seatbelt actually, actually showed up in the car and everybody says, what's this now? You know, because it wasn't a law. And I think that probably the, the automobile manufacturers knew that it was coming. So people felt like the seatbelt was kind of, uh, at first it was uh, intriguing and it was, uh, you know, it was kind of like this uh, inquisitive thing. But when it, when it became law, people were angry. They felt they were being euchred into this, forced into it. And you were in many ways bucking public opinion big time. I remember women complaining. Well, yeah. even when the shoulder strap came out, or, or was uh, in law, a part of the law years later? Because it was, first it was just a seat belt, right? Right. Then that the harness. Be, right. And you guys had to fight everybody all along the way to save yeah. their lives and, and help them from getting hurt. Right. They, they would be, some of the arguments that we'd run across is, uh, it would wrinkles my clothes, or <laughs> I'm afraid I'm going to get trapped. I'll put the seat belt on, but what if I need to get out in an accident? What if it, the car starts on fire and I can't, I panic and I can't get out? Some of those sorts of things. And we had to use uh, 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 law enforcement and doctors and nurses and survivors of uh, auto accidents that people were buckled up or people who had relatives, celebrities and others who had relatives who did die in accidents and said, boy, I wish they were buckled up. Yeah. And, um, uh, you know, and explain why financially it affected everyone from uh, from an insurance standpoint and and uh, ambulances and other other services out there. When people don't buckle up, if you don't buckle up, it affects more than just yourself. Not to mention your loved ones. Think about others. So that's that. Those are kind of some of the things that we we looked at back then. Were you involved with the Click It or Ticket campaign? Yeah, that uh, over the years, right, we did that. And uh, um, if anybody wants to really see a, a fun video, I think it's still on YouTube. Back in the early stages, I think it was in 1984, we did a, um, a Buckle Up uh, uh, Michigan campaign where we had a number of celebrities. And it's kind of fun to watch. I think we had like 35 celebrities in there at the time. And if you can... So the, the, some of who have been around for a while might look at that video and uh, and see people and see how many of you recognize. But they were all the top Michigan celebrities people. at the time: uh, Bo Schembechler and and uh, Bob Talbert, who used to be a columnist at the Free Press, and yeah. Bill Bonds sure. when he was an uh, anchor person and that kind of thing. So it's it's a fun video. We had Sparky Anderson, and, you know, a number of people. It was it was a a fun one, but. Encourage people, hey, look at how fun this is, but putting on your seatbelt. We also learned in seatbelt use, by the way, and it's I've used this analogy uh, elsewhere in business or talking to my kids or whatever, and that is that it, it takes 10 times in a row for you to develop a habit of something. So we learned that if you can get somebody to buckle up 10 times in a row, they won't have to think about it the 11th time or the 12th time or the 13th right. time. Right. So, uh, I always uh, tell others that, hey, if you get in a habit of doing something, it's, uh, it's amazing how that habit turns into, uh, or how that activity turns into a habit. So let's go back to crisis prevention, crisis management. 
uh, I've always been intrigued by psychology and how it plays into almost every aspect of life. Um, as somebody who teaches presentation skills, does sales training, uh, so many salespeople working against themselves, not even understanding how their own psychology is hampering them. Uh, crisis prevention has a psychological component as well. There are people that convince themselves they don't need to think about it. It's never going to happen. Yep. How do, you, um, how do you approach this with people and uh, the non-believers? Yeah, uh, it's a great question because you're right. People will say, hey, I, we, you know, we're really good at managing things. We don't need to think about a crisis in advance. Um, or we could never plan for a crisis. We have no idea what kind of crisis might come up. Mm -hmm. And if it comes up, we'll, we'll figure it out. The problem with that is, one key factor in managing a crisis well, the key factor, is you have to be able to move decisively and quickly to prove that you have the crisis under control. And, and you just can't do that if you're not prepared in advance. If you're not prepared in advance, it takes too long to, okay, figure out who's gonna do what and all of that. That was really the crux of my book, the Crisis Counselor, a step-by-step -step guide to managing a business crisis. There were a couple of crisis books before I wrote the, I wrote the book, um, but they were all about what to do after the crisis happens. Yeah, You're my the office now, Jeff. Yeah, it's uh, it's so it's it's this yeah. book here. I, I saw it when I was. Uh, you were nice enough to give me a tour a few weeks back. I did see yeah. it in your office. Yeah, uh, and this is still available, still in print. I know it came out a little bit ago. Yeah, it is still, but it's uh, not as available as it really ought to be. <laughs> um, McGraw-Hill, uh, uh, like for some reason, did, decided not to reprint it again, even though it's being used in over 100 universities. And, uh, and like I said, is in, in five different languages, here happens to be the, the Chinese version of, uh, wow. of, of the book. But... Um, so every book before that really was after the fact, was disaster control. My book was a seven step process to managing uh, a crisis situation and four of them happen, happens before a crisis actually even occurs. So identifying vulnerabilities, preventing the crisis from, from occurring, um, being planned in, uh, in advance and you know, you'd always be amazed at what can be done before a crisis actually occurs. You can prepare for a crisis. Uh, and, and you can also identify in your organization what is uh, your highest vulnerability of not only what's most likely to occur, but also uh, if one were to occur, what would be most damaging. And by the way, Michael, that, that nowadays, companies, organizations of all type, are more vulnerable to a crisis than ever before. Individuals are more, more vulnerable to a crisis from ever before because of technology, right? Because of social media, because of how quickly the word spreads. It used to be back when I started in the PR business, um, and, and I am uh, uh, in my 40th year, uh, believe it or not, of, uh, of being in the PR business and having my own PR firm for many, many years, that uh, that people realize that uh, that getting prepared for a crisis is is just something you can kind of wing, and it's uh, the more you learn about it and the more you see the mistakes made by others, you realize that that's not the case at all. Yeah, if you think back. Um if the rule of thumb has always been you need to be prepared for this because when it happens, bad news is going to travel really fast. Yeah. Imagine how fast it travels now. And we oh see this God. happen just with uh, celebrity tweets. Uh, yes. The one just from last week, not to purposely date this video, but you can just choose something every week. Something's going on. Yeah. Somebody from the NBA tweeted something nasty about China. And I'm telling you, man, they were, they were just like back stroking, as fast right. as they could to, to, to um, uh, spin it. Yeah. Yeah, you know, there's the, the old saying of cascading a, uh, a communication like in an organization where you cascade something from 
the top and throughout the organization and that kind of thing. Yeah. But it's the, uh, it's, you, you can see the cascading, the domino effect and how, man, how quickly it happens through social media and how it used to be that we relied on the news media and any sort of journalistic standards that media would have to, to help ensure accuracy. And why don't we do that anymore? For, for, yeah. And uh, objectivity and all of that sort of thing. And now you have people going straight to Twitter, uh, our president and others who go right through, uh, right to Twitter. They don't go to the media. A lot of sports athletes do that now, not relying on others to, to refocus their message, but having them do it directly. And, well, we also so, have news platforms that, free are, for all. that are not objective. Uh, a lot of the news is pre-digested for us. Yeah. Uh, which sometimes slants whatever is being communicated. Do you, with all your years of experience, do you find, um, do you find or do you think that you might be better at predicting crises, crisis before it actually happens? Do you actually see leading indicators? Well, for, for sure. Uh, uh, almost every crisis, not everyone, but almost everyone is preceded by some sort of a warning sign. If you think about it, if you think about uh, something a disgruntled employee, oh yeah, that person said such and such, or geez, we've seen some behavior that was disconcerting. Um, a, a quality problem with something, yeah, we had some complaints about that. Um, we couldn't quite get our arms around it. A number of things like that, that, that uh, when you look at the vulnerabilities in an organization, you step back and say, you know, we should always know how vulnerable we are to certain situations. If we were to have a crisis, what would it be in? What do we think we are vulnerable to having? And can we prevent some of those instead of shoving the uh, warning sign under a rug and hoping it goes away, actually addressing it? And if we can't address it to the point where it goes away, let's get ready on what would happen if that ever did turn into a crisis? What would we say? Who would say it? How would we say it? Yeah. How communicated would we need to be? How would we contact some of the people that we would want to have them hear it from us first rather than uh, hearing it from someone else or seeing it on social media or hearing about it uh, or seeing it through the media? And do we have that list of, of people and contact information ready at the ready? So we don't have to create the list before we contact them. Exactly. Remember, we talked about the uh, uh, how how important it is to be decisive and to be able to move quickly because you've got a short window to prove to others that you have the situation under control. If you're trying to find that list, you don't know how to get a hold of people, uh, or it happens after hours, or whatever might be the case you're all of a sudden now you're outside that window you're painted into a corner and now that you've now made the crisis much harder than it, than it might have been otherwise and and the and the crises have taken a different shape in as of late because a lot of times well back in the day if there was a crisis it was usually a real crisis but now it's you have to kind of discern whether it's hearsay or urban legend some yeah, sort right. of campaign by the competition Remember the Tylenol uh, crisis? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, there were two of them uh, in 82, I think, in 85. And, um, um, I, 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 you know, again, that's, that was a matter of being communicative, you know, uh, treating people the way that you would want to be treated. What would I expect to hear? Depending on who I am, how would I expect to to hear from and when, yeah. you know, all of those sorts of things can be thought of in advance. Everyone who's got a, has a business, we want to treat all clients and customers like they're all the important and all the same. But in reality, usually there are some that are more important that would expect a phone call, maybe expect a personal visit to be told it rather than an email or um, to read about it. Uh, you know, elsewise, 
then that's that's where you you get where somebody is like, hey, I, I'm more upset with the fact that you didn't give me the courtesy to let me know about it than I am about your, the crisis itself. Yeah, this is why the delay is almost never good. When there's a delay in the response, everybody thinking, well, they're, they're stalling for time, they're making something up, they don't have their facts straight, they're not ready. Um, I think it's also why the President of the United States, I think as a routine, they call uh, the deceased uh, military, the, the families of the deceased in the military. It's not a letter, it's not a FedEx, right. it's not a newspaper announcement, it's a personal phone call. They've been doing it for years. Yeah, probably not a national crisis, but it's certainly a crisis for that family. Right. Uh, the other thing, uh, Michael, is that the importance of sort of stating the obvious, but it's worth underscoring. Yeah. The the importance of reputation. Yeah. The importance of credibility, and trust, and integrity, and character, and and how all of us want to have that, but so do companies, sort of organizations. What do you stand for? What are you known as? Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, what is the brand? Uh, do you, and you see that all the time when, when someone or some organization has a great reputation, how they are given the benefit of the doubt. Uh, or uh, maybe their window is a little bit wider, a little bit bigger. Um, and, and then you also see what happens if someone has a bad reputation. Or someone who may have messed up in the in the past, and how oh geez, no wonder I'm not surprised that they had a situation like that. So the whole idea of protecting and preserving a reputation, a reputation can take decades to build. Yeah, decades, and can go away, can be destroyed or certainly damaged, literally in in a few minutes. So you wrote the book on this. What does the book say about how to handle apologies? It's been a delicate area. Apology uh, sometimes viewed as an admission of guilt. Uh, a lack of apology means uh, sometimes interpreted as a lack of remorse. How do you find the right tone and, and the right venue for, a, for an apology? Lately, uh, people are being accused on Twitter. They, I mean, the person doesn't even contact the other person. They just accuse them on Twitter. And then right. this person doesn't bother to talk to this person. They just apologize on Twitter because now they have to make it a public apology. How do you, right. how do you handle apologies in your business? Well, in business, it's, it's always a little, a little complex. And um, yeah, it, almost every crisis situation that I've been involved with, with businesses over the years, always involves some legal counsel that, uh, you know, that, that was involved in the discussion as well, and as as you know, oftentimes legal counsel would say, "Hey, let's be careful about that apology." And well, you know, we don't yeah. want to admit guilt that's going to end up hurting us in the court of law. Right. You know, uh, at the same time, when we look at the effects and the damage of the court of public opinion, you look at the the damage to reputation that took decades to build, and we don't want to damage it or lose it all in. A short period of time. So my sense is that you can always apologize for something, uh, and and uh, without necessarily admitting uh, guilt. Uh, and actually, one of the the real hallmarks of of uh, any sort of response in a crisis is to be careful not to assume or speculate on what actually occurred. In the crisis, before you you can uh, you can confirm it with 100% certainty. One of the worst things to do is to say one thing about what you think happened, and then find out later that's not what happened at all. When you did a little bit more research and you did your review or investigation, and now you're backtracking and perhaps even being accused of lying or trying to talk your way out of it or whatever. So oftentimes, sometimes you have to say, uh, uh, you know, we ap apologize certainly for the situation. This is what we can, what we can confirm at this time is such and such. 
We're looking into the matter further. We are on top of it. When we have more information, we will provide um, uh, more information and more perspective on it. But at this point, we, we don't want to speculate without doing uh, further background on, on whatever, if it were something that just kind of came up uh, immediately like that. So, but I always say, and it sounds so basic, and it's funny when I talk and hold seminars and that kind of thing on crisis communications, it always seems so basic. And that is that, uh, that put yourself in the other's shoes. What would you expect to hear? How would you expect to be told? What would you be disappointed by if you weren't told? And, and you know, there's an old saying that, that you can actually take a crisis situation and actually make it a positive if it's handled right. Hmm. You can actually establish stronger bonds with someone. I wanted to let you know about this. I wanted to ask you a favor in this regard. You're establishing even closer bonds with a, with a client or a customer. And you let them know that, that you really cared enough about them to communicate directly with them about it. You know, I can't help but uh, think about the recent, and hopefully it's over, I mean, hopefully, we can get past this and, and move on to better relationships between gender and that sort of thing. But I'm, I keep thinking about the Me Too movement and some of these bad things that have happened to women um, that are sometimes cast in he said, she said scenarios where someone remembers something differently, say, eight years ago. Uh, and then the apology comes out in strange, sometimes even absent apologies. But then strange apologies, you know, I'm sorry you remember it that way, or I'm sorry you had a bad experience. Um, when something happened a long time ago and becomes a crisis, does it, does it become more difficult to deal with? Because it, I don't know, it's just hard to find, to get to the facts? Well, you know, it, there, as, as you know, because I know you, uh, you're very good at uh, teaching this as well, there are, ways to apologize and then there are backhanded ways to apologize yeah. and there are ways that uh, people will apologize with or make it sound like an apology and they're not really apologizing yeah so i there's think been a, there's been a lot of that and i'm not sure why it yeah. seems like if you've got time to craft it it's called wordsmithing any writer knows how to do this and yet we see the most the strangest i'm sorry's ever yeah. Why right. is that? Is it because our ego gets in the way? It doesn't allow us to do the right thing, to say the right thing? Right. Yeah. And the, the, when someone says, I'm, I'm sorry that you feel that way. Yeah. As opposed to, I'm sorry about my behavior. Yeah. I'm sorry about what occurred. Uh, what about, I'm sorry if... And I don't want to just focus on me too. If somebody, um, somebody's had a bad experience with a product, for example, I'm sorry that if you've had a bad experience with our product, that's not a direct apology for the product or how it performed, but it's a genuine empathic response to a, a bad scenario, yeah? Right, yeah, for sure. And you, you know what I like? I like, uh, I'm sorry you even had to contact us on this. Oh yeah. I, I, I can understand how frustrated you are and you know what? I want to make it right. Yes. Yeah. And so now all of a sudden the person is like, okay, he's, this person's not going to fight me on it. Yeah. I want to make it right. So if you weren't happy with it, I want to, I want to make sure I understand why and we want to make it right. And, uh, and again, I, 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 I'm sorry that you even had to be put in this situation. And I think that's customer service 101 when you tweet a bad customer experience. Now, a bad customer experience is not necessarily a crisis, but it can start like that. So what almost every company does, it's very well scripted now. You've probably seen it a million times. They reply by saying, please message us. They want to, first of all, get it off the public platform. Please message us with the specifics of your scenario so we can be attentive to it. 
So it, it right. does a couple of things. It takes them off of the public rant. Right. Uh, it lets everybody know that's watching the public rant that we volunteered to take this off offline and fix it. And if the other person doesn't reply or continues to rant, it kind of shows that there's a one-sided agenda maybe being played out. Right. It doesn't make yeah, it any easier. But right. Yeah. Yeah, we really want to make it right. And, yeah. and we're sorry that you feel that way. And yeah. uh, I love it. We never want to disappoint anyone. How does your background in crisis management and crisis prevention inform your work as EDP of corporate communications and marketing at Tryon Solutions? And before you answer that, please tell everybody specifically what Tryon Solutions does. It's a very interesting company. Yeah, uh, Tryon Solutions is a, uh, uh, one of the nation's largest HR administration companies. So we say at Tryon that Tryon relieves the stress and burden of managing HR administration alone. So for small companies, the, the real value proposition is you don't need to build an HR department. You can, uh, you can count on Tryon because we're specialists in payroll and processing and taxes and uh, benefits administration, regulatory compliance and workers' compensation. And we can handle that for you so you don't have to hire an HR person and build a, a, a department. For larger companies, the value proposition is you don't have to build the HR department beyond just a core group. You might always need people to, to work on strategic HR issues like hiring and, and recruiting and training and some of those sorts of issues, but let us do the time consuming work, uh, the payroll and processing and benefits administration and chasing down the workers comp issues and regulatory compliance and all of that. So that's what Tryon does. Um, but keep, keep in mind when we're talking about uh, sort of what we do or what I do, um, that the crisis area is only a, part, a small part of, in, in a way of, of, of what I do, but in a, it's a big way in the sense that, again, protecting and preserving a reputation. But I'm also in charge of helping to shape and, and form that reputation and that brand. Um, and I've done that for, I've worked with uh, probably over a thousand different companies during my PR agency career, uh, having Capanegro Public Relations over the years. And before that, I was the CEO of the largest PR firm in Michigan. Um, I've had, I had Capanegro Public Relations for 23 years. Wow. Before that, I was the CEO called, of uh, the largest PR firm in Michigan at the time called Casey Communications. And um, so I've been working with different companies throughout my entire career and learned an awful lot about how to obtain positive visibility, uh, how to enhance that reputation, uh, how to shape that brand and that kind of thing. I, I love being at Tryon because we've got a great team here. Uh, it's a fantastic company uh, with corporate headquarters in Troy, Michigan and offices in uh, Florida and Arizona and up in Traverse City, Michigan. It's, uh, you know, we're doing a whole bunch of things to help shape that brand and reputation. Uh, and it's, 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 it's really a lot of fun. Uh, it's tryonworks.com, everybody, if you want to check out the company itself. Are you available? Uh, I don't want to put you on the spot, but are you still doing talks and are you available? For oh, yeah, people? absolutely. Yeah, I do a lot of that. And uh, let me just uh, offer a slight correction. You can get to the Tryon website through tryonworks.com, but even a better one is relyontryon.com. So <laughs> rely on Tryon, which is T R I O N.com. I couldn't and, have uh, noticed that that rhymes, Jeff. Yeah, rely on Tryon. And, <laughs> and one of our, the things that we've done over the last year is we have a brand new website. Uh, we have uh, a little animated video in there that tells the value proposition of, uh, of Tryon. It's, it's really well worth stopping to, to uh, go in and visit, uh, visit that website. But yes, to answer your question, I do a lot of speaking. I've always done that over the years. Uh, on reputation, branding, crisis communications, crisis planning, uh, and, uh, and that kind of thing. Beautiful. 
Let's close with a look into the crystal ball. You got your Ouija board out? Yes. <laughs> you said that you were good at uh, seeing um, crises, maybe before they develop, before they, before they uh, launch, uh, probably a bad word, happen. Um, who's headed toward a crisis? <laughs> companies? Well, I'm, are, companies I'm sure are, no companies would, let, would want me to uh, pronounce to the world and uh, your many uh, subscribers <laughs> to uh, my, my prediction of them having a, a crisis. But I'll tell you that uh, you can kind of see if you, again, if you realize that every, almost every crisis is preceded by some sort of a warning sign. You, you can see about, warning signs. If you can't talk about names of companies, how about industries? How about, how about trends that seem to be in trouble? How about politics? Well, the one, the one trend that you see that uh, I have actually been involved with a few companies to help them are our um, uh, problems with technology, our, our breaches of confidentiality, our uh, confidential data being being uh, being uh, compromised. Compromised. Thank you. And um, who hasn't been hacked? And exactly. And but. People are trusting websites and trusting organizations that they'll keep their information uh, confidential. And that's a great vulnerability to say, what would happen if we ever had that in our company? How would we respond? What would we say? How would we communicate that? Uh, and what are we doing to make sure to minimize that vulnerability? We can't maybe prevent it totally, but what can we do to minimize it? How are our firewalls doing? What are we doing to try to hack into our own system or having some outside specialists that we can work with to make sure that we are uh, as sound as we should be? So, so that clearly is a, we've seen it happen, uh, a major vulnerability for nowadays uh, so many organizations around the world uh, and we've seen the data some of you if uh, uh, I, yeah, I was visited Walsh College uh, a few weeks ago they have a map in the uh, in one of their rooms that is actually a live map that shows the uh, which which uh, websites and uh, internet sites are being hacked at any given time which companies and the lights go off. Uh, it's, it's it's amazing when you look oh, at there's it. There's software for that. Uh, I'm sorry. There's software for that. There. Uh, I don't know what software Walsh uses for that map of theirs, but it's uh, it's pretty amazing. I mean, there's lights flashing all over the place, all around the world. Uh, yeah, you know, you mentioned data, and a big part of data now, of course, is video. Yeah. And the what's interesting to me, I'm reading. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell's latest book, which is Talking to Strangers. He opens the book and closes it with the Sandra Bland story. Uh, for those of you not familiar, she was a motorist in, who had recently wrote, relocated to Texas. She was stopped. The dash cam of the police officer that stops her records the entire scenario. And you can just see uh, problems with the stop. Not that, not that she was completely cooperative, but you know, it takes two to tango sometimes. But this police officer who allegedly does everything by routine and he's done it many, many times, you know, it's all there on video. And a lot of the times these indicators that you're speaking of, these, these hints, these clues that something bad is about to happen yep. is right in front of us. It, if we would just pay attention to it. Right. Okay. Right. So that would be an example of, okay, if you knew that that was a vulnerability, then what are we doing in our training yeah. to address that? And how often do we do that training? That might have been a veteran police officer that might have had training 10 years ago. That dash cam video is on YouTube. It's had a million views. Yeah. Police departments taking hits on the chin every time it's shown. Police departments, you know, everybody's skittish now about getting stopped by the police. Like the police are bad people. And right. this is the kind of thing I think that needs to be backspinned in order to get us back to where we believe in our law enforcement again. A right. form of crisis, if you ask me, that that uh, when, I, when I grew up, 
if a police officer told you to do something, you did it. Not for sure. <laughs> but today, there's something about our society, again, psychology, again, crisis, you know, uh, impending crisis. The, the guy says, get out of the car, and, and you refuse to get out of the car. What, what, what does that leave the police officer? What, ki- what type of alternative? And now the whole thing's being recorded. There's people on the sidewalk recording it. And before you know it, you've got a full-blown mess. Right. Back in the day, uh, if there was a television crew camera that, that captured something, that would be a, a, a big deal. Now everyone's got a television camera in a way with yeah. their phone, right? Yeah. And and people love taking a video of something. We've unfortunately we've seen it with people who are being attacked or having some sort of a problem. Uh, uh, could use somebody to help them, and meanwhile somebody's taking a video rather than yeah. helping them. So it's just kind of human nature, unfortunately. Now, but for the sake of our discussion here, it reinforces that that we're more vulnerable to a crisis than ever before. Any of us, uh, any company, any organization, uh, and the importance of reputation and credibility and trust and honesty and integrity and character and all of those things. Those are organizations. Those are traits that we wanna be associated with in our friends. We want our family to have that. We want our company to have that. Um, we want our employees to have that. And you know, so it's, that's why it's so important to always be looking at what our vulnerabilities are and, and trying to prevent them or reduce them. And then if think about what we would do if any of those were to occur and what can we do in advance to prepare for those uh, potential vulnerabilities from turning into a problem that if not handled right, turns into a crisis. And if not handled right, turns into a disaster. And uh, that's where you really see uh, companies potentially even going out of business. So uh, based on that. So a lot of our discussion today has been predicated on, um, on the corporations staying out of the muck, we should we should probably conclude by saying uh, this is this is my view. I'm certain it's yours too, but it, it, it we should say it is that nobody ever wants anything bad to happen. This is not about saving money or saving reputation. It's about it's about keeping bad things from happening to people, uh, because that's really the definition of a crisis. I think is bad stuff happening to people. So this is not about playing defense and, and getting in front of it for the sake of saving your company. It's about keeping bad things from happening to people. You are a professional, man. I, I really appreciate you. Well, thank you, Michael. Yeah, they, the one thing about uh, a good close might be that when we talk about bad things happening, uh, bad things, when they do happen, they are disruptions. They are things that, uh, get in the way of uh, progress and of you know how we all feel about each other and how we feel about that company or that organization yeah. and uh, and so if it can be avoided by doing the right thing then uh, then we we certainly ought to do that now you may think well well then why don't we why doesn't everybody do the right thing why why is this such an issue for businesses or nonprofits or whoever it might be. The problem is business moves so fast these days that oftentimes, like we talked about, a warning sign gets shoved under a rug or gets forgotten about, or things just happen so quickly that uh, you don't take the time to do that, to step back and say, what are we vulnerable? uh, And, you know, what can we do to make sure we are always doing the right thing? Are we training our people well enough? Are we saying the right things? Are we reinforcing and enforcing our behavior? Well said. I'm sure that talking, us talking about this today will help people. And I'm so glad that you're on the case. I'm proud to know you. I can't wait to help celebrate your induction into the Detroit chapter of the Public Relations Hall of Fame, HOF. Thank you, the Public Relations Society of America, Detroit chapter. I'm fortunate to have also been in, I should give a plug out to my uh, 
my uh, my my university that I attended. I'm I'm also in the Central Michigan University Journalism Hall of Fame, and I'm also in the National Public Relations Society of America College of Fellows, which is a great oh. honor for uh, a, a a PR person as well. Fantastic, Jeff Caponegro, Everybody, he wrote the book on crisis uh, management and prevention. It's called The Crisis Counselor. Go get a copy of it. And, uh, and thank you so much for being with us today, Jeff. Thank you, Michael. I always enjoy talking with you and being with you. And uh, uh, I've always enjoyed everything that you, uh, you post. And it's great to be part of it. And uh, thank you very much. My pleasure, sir.